Welcome to our eighth season of Archaeology Cafe. Um, when we first started doing this, it was hard to imagine that this would be so successful that we'd be continuing it for eight years. Um, just a couple of things to, to catch up on. First of all, um, this event tonight is made possible by the Arizona Humanities Council. Their support of, of this event for the third or fourth year in a row is much appreciated. Um, and I need to put on my glasses. Uh, announcing the happy publication of the new issue of Archaeology Southwest magazine, focusing on Santa Fe downtown. This should be in your mailbox in just a couple of days. And um, our dear boss, Dil Bill Doley, is, is not here tonight due to a cold, and we, we apologize. Bill wanted to say some remarks to kick off the event, but uh, he's just not, uh, not up for it. So with that said, I'm just going to go ahead and open the floor to Jeffrey Ferguson. He's an associ assistant research professor at the University of Missouri and uh, running the, the research reactor there. And let's talk some archaeometry. Come on up. Thank you. You're welcome. I've never been mic'd before, so does this, can you guys hear it? Does that work? All right. Just to clarify, since this is, you know, I'm, I'm happy to get the promotion, but since it's going online, I'm not the director of the reactor. So that's about six levels above me, I think. So. Uh, so what I thought I would do today, I guess I was hoping you could ask questions while I'm talking in case those people who have to leave early, can we maybe make an exception if you're really desperate or poor that, that they could ask? If people raise their hands, I'll be happy to take <laughs> questions. Um, so what I, what I thought I would talk about today, I had, I had grand expectations for getting this big theoretical approach to big data. Um, and I tried to think about it and I really found I couldn't quite answer my own questions. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is talk a little bit about the history of the lab, try to explain why there's this really strong connection between the southwest of the U.S. and some little tiny speck out in the middle of Missouri, and what that connection is and why it is that I work with most of the people associated with Archaeology Southwest, um, and it kind of explain the history of our lab, what we do, and then some of the questions we are encountering as, we continue, as this lab continues to grow, and we analyze more and more and more data, um, what that means. And, and I'm really, tonight I'll... I'll talk a few times in this dichotomy between lithics and ceramics, and I realize there are other sources of archaeological data out there, such as bones um, and other things, but I, I gave it, I'll, I'll talk earlier today on skill and, and learning, and I found that I, those two create a really interesting dichotomy, and they're interesting to compare to each other, both in terms of past societies and how archaeologists approach them as well. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, to give you some basic history, so I am... Uh, the archaeologist, the, the, the only archaeology faculty at the University of Missouri Research Reactor. Um, they, the lab started, the reactor itself is the largest research based, excuse me, university based research reactor in the US. So there are obviously much bigger power reactors. Um, as an example, there's a power reactor right down the road from us that is about a thousand times the energetic, energetic output that we are. Um, but in terms of research reactors, we're really, you know, uh, about as big as they come um, at universities. There are a few bigger, but... Um, so the reactor, I believe, was constructed and has been in operation since the 19... I believe 60s. It was a little before my time. Um, but I, so I've been there since 2007 or 2006. So to give you an idea of how the... why there is an archaeometry laboratory at the research reactors. People always wonder, I say I work at a research reactor, and they wonder what in the world is an archaeologist doing there? Uh, the lab has a kind of an interesting history. So it started with uh, two archae an archaeologist and a physicist. The physicist was at the reactor. I've yet to figure out what the archaeologist association was. He may have been in the anthropology department. And he got an NSF grant to in the early 80s to characterize all of the obsidian sources in Mesoamerica. So this was using neutron activation, which I'll explain in a minute. But basically travel to Mexico, collect geologic source specimens, bring them back to Missouri, and analyze them by neutron activation. Uh, the, the archaeologists spent three years in the field doing this. In the meantime, they hired Mike Glasscock, who I still work with today, um, as a physicist to help manage the software, organize the data, work out some analytical techniques. And they had a graduate student as well. So this is this four-person team. They were going to start this laboratory, do this great work. The archaeologists spent three years in Mexico, got married to a Mexican woman, brought her back to Missouri in the fall, and she said, no way. Didn't even get to winter. Um, and very quickly, they returned to Mexico permanently. So uh, that was a, that was a short-lived thing. Um, he brought back 2,000 pounds of obsidian with him. So here they are with 2,000 pounds of obsidian samples from Mesoamerica. The archaeologist goes away. The physicist involved is diagnosed with terminal cancer. 
The graduate student can see things not going in a really good direction, so he leaves the reactor altogether to go work at a power plant, and that left Mike Glasscock, a physicist, with 2,000 pounds of rocks and not a lot of archaeological experience to go on at the time. So uh, Mike started analyzing these samples. It turned out to be really interesting and great data that they were getting, um, stuff that people hadn't really done before. He hired Mike Elam uh, at the time to they, that was in the late 80s, they submitted the first National Science Foundation grant to support the laboratory. Um, and that model has continued to this day. So we, I'll explain a little bit about how the lab works in terms of funding, um, and that may explain a little bit about why Archaeology Southwest has a strong connection to us. Um, Hector Neff joined the reactor in 1990 and stayed until 2002, in which case Jeff Speakman took over for a few years. He left in 2006, and I filled in right behind him and have been there since. So going back to... The 80s, it's been a, a collaborative effort between Mike on the physics side and then one of three archaeologists that seems to kind of rotate through. So hopefully I'll be there for a long time, but um, it's been a really useful collaboration because it allows us to, to approach things with a very difficult analytical side um, as well as from, an archaeology, from the archaeology and an archaeological theory side. Um, so over the 20, I don't know what it is, 26 years that we've had this continuous funding and this lab in place, um, that accounts for 10 consecutive National Science Foundation funding rounds, um, which is a, a pretty impressive feat. Uh, we've analyzed over 150,000 archaeological specimens, and, and a lot of those are with neutron activation. In fact, the vast majority of those. And those are not, by no means a simple matter. These involve one to two hours of labor per sample um, to get these things ready. This isn't, this isn't like modern X-ray fluorescence, which is a real quick, you, could, you can boost those numbers quickly um, now. Um, we've trained over 130 graduate students, and I think that number is probably a couple years old. Um, I, can't, I have lots of people come to work with me, and we teach them how to work with their data, and then they go back and, and finish things up. And a number of people at Archaeology Southwest have done that. Um, we've trained dozens of undergraduates. So our, our funding really, from National Science Foundation, really subsidizes outsiders to submit samples to us. What it, what it really pays for is the undergraduate labor. So we have undergraduates that work in our lab, many of them archaeologists, many have gone on uh, to graduate school in archaeology. Um, and we've also amassed over 500 staff publications. So these aren't just publications with our data, these are publications that we are involved in writing and publishing. So that's a pretty impressive record over a 20-some year span. Um, I wanted to quickly go over some of the methods, just so you know what I'm talking about. Um, neutron activation is has been the core of our facility. We're, that's the reason we're at a nuclear reactor. We can do x-ray fluorescence anywhere, but you kind of need a reactor to do neutron activation analysis. Um, we use it primarily for, for ceramics. Um, it's a, in theory, it's a relatively simple technique. You take a piece of pottery, you grind it up, homogenize it, you take a small sample of that, put it into the reactor. We do it a couple different ways. When it comes out, we measure the gamma rays that come off, and it's a, it's a relatively straightforward way of getting really precise data on a number of elements. Um, so it's ideal for ceramics. Um, we've used it for other things. That be, the, the initial applications were for obsidian. Found that for obsidian, it's often a little more than is necessary. We can get away with less destructive um, and less costly techniques. But I'll, I'll talk about x-ray fluorescence in a minute. Um, it's relatively cheap compared to petrography, um, and in no way diminishing the role of petrography. The two work really well together. <laughs> Um, they're, they're really complementary techniques, and unfortunately, people don't tend to use both of them. They tend to be either petrography-oriented or NAA-oriented, and Mary and I are working hard to try to get people to, to find that middle ground and do both. Um, but NAA is cheaper, so I will say that. Um, maybe it requires less, far less you know, skill. I don't know what the, what the, what the reason may be, but um, yeah, that's right. We can, anybody can do NAA. But, um, and so, in terms of the Southwest, so we, like I said, we've analyzed probably about 80 to 100,000 samples by neutron activation analysis, and this is a really amazing database of information, uh, in part because it's stable over a long term. Um, a lot of analytical techniques, particularly X-ray fluorescence and ICP that I'll talk about next, it's, it's not always easy to analyze a sample and then compare that to something you analyze five years later, let alone even the next day. Sometimes there can be, there are reasons why the data aren't as internally consistent. Neutron activation is really straightforward to standardize. Uh, there are a number of other labs in the country that still do this. They tend to be funding their, only their own research, like at Oregon State and a couple places. Um, they do that, and we can actually share data between labs. And even on incredibly precise, minute trace elements, um, we can just bring their data right in. Sometimes there's a minor transformation we have to do, but it's, it's really nice. So even stuff that was run at uh, 
Brookhaven or Berkeley National Laboratory 20, 30, 40 years ago, we can pull that data right in and, and, and compare these massive databases um, of ceramic production. So the southwest of, the, of what we have done, I'm not certain if it's quite the largest. It may be in competition with Mesoamerica for the largest regional database that we have. But the southwest is, is probably more so today even um, the biggest chunk of the world where we do nutrient activation analysis of ceramics. Um, I, believe, I went through and tried to kind of count what the numbers were, and I get roughly about 25,000 samples that we have run from the Southwest on exclusively pottery. That would include clays and some other things. Um, and I tried to go through and pick out names that I recognized that had an Archaeology Southwest connection. I would say a good third to half of those um, are either run directly through Archaeology Southwest or involved with people who are or were here. So folks like Matt Peoples or, or people who have association with, the, with Archaeology Southwest have done a lot of samples through, through our laboratory. Um, and that forms the bulk of our, our connection with Archaeology Southwest. So in terms of techniques, that one's pretty straightforward. You radiate it, measure the gamma rays, you get really good, precise information. Um, X-ray fluorescence, many of you may, have, may be somewhat familiar with this. It's a technique, it's, it's one of the advantages of it is that it is completely non-destructive. So we can take obsidian artifacts, put it on the X-ray fluorescence instrument, and it, we, there's no damage to it. Um, and it's many, in fact, many of the instruments are portable, so we can actually take them into the field, which is useful working in some countries where you can't remove the materials. You can do that. Um, in theory, it's not that complicated. You're taking, you know, you're, you're basically zapping the sample with X-rays, it shifts the electrons around a little bit, and when, when the electrons shift back to where they should be, they give off X-rays of known energy for each element. So it, it works really well. Um, the problem with it is that it's not as precise as neutron activation analysis, uh, and you don't get as many good elements out of it. So it works really well for obsidian, where you only need five or six elements to do most of the characterization of different obsidian sources. It is not good for pottery, and I, I, I have, every time I see somebody, they want to talk about their pottery data set with XRF because somebody loaned them a free instrument and they've got all this data. And it takes usually about 20 minutes for me to finally convince them they should just walk away and just let it go. It's really a hard thing to do because they feel like they've invested this in it, but it is really difficult. I can't think of a, a good example of looking at pottery paste with X-ray fluorescence um, that has produced meaningful and reliable results. Now, there, there may be one, um, but I'm not aware of it. So XRF is really great in the Southwest. Uh, the Southwest, particularly, I focus prim my research primarily in New Mexico, but kind of in that border region. Um, and in New Mexico, there really aren't any sources we can't differentiate by X-ray fluorescence. We've got a few unknown sources that, are, that show up every once in a while, but it works really well. Arizona, I think, is a pretty similar scenario. I, it, even Arizona to, South, to New Mexico works well. Um, I do a lot of work in other parts of the world. Uh, I've done a big project in the Rift Valley of Kenya, where we have over 80 different compositional groups just there, and we don't even think we've hit half of the sources. And X-ray fluorescence, it can, it can separate about five of those out, but the rest of them, it's just, it's one of these 30 sources, or it's one of these 20 sources. Um, so there are parts of the world where XRF is not necessarily ideal. Um, the other technique, so, so XRF has really taken off mainly since I've been there. Um, we had an instrument before I got there. Since I've been there, we've added a few portable instruments. We now have a, a big desktop uh, instrument. Um, and so we're analyzing, unfortunately, usually for free, which is something that gets me in trouble a lot, but we're analyzing about 10 to 20,000 samples a year um, by XRF. So that number has sort of swamped the, or dwarfed the NAA data uh, pretty quickly. But I don't know how much longer I can get away with that. So um, one of the things we're trying to do, and I see, did I see Jeff come in? Jeff? Oh, just here. I just recently was speaking with, with Jeff Clark about um, the need. So in the Southwest, you've got, I'll see if I can draw it here. I'll see if I can do this. New Mexico goes like that, right? And then Arizona goes something like that. Um, New Mexico, most of the sources are here on the western side. You've got, I can draw a better map at some point here. And so you get a lot of New Mexico archaeologists that know these sources really well, but a lot of the sources, particularly the major ones, are right along this border. And you get folks that work out here in Arizona with various sources all over the place. And, and Jeff is my example of the Arizona folks. They know, if you go to a site here, I think Jeff could very quickly predict you tell him when and where, and he could tell you, oh, that's going to be this source and this source. And I'm the same. You tell me here, I can tell you what source and where reasonably. Now, where it's different is where it's interesting. Um, but there's this whole border here that things don't seem to move. I mean, I've probably analyzed 50,000 artifacts through New Mexico, and aside from one little source that occurs right in Arizona here, I could probably count on one hand the number of Arizona artifacts that I've analyzed in New Mexico. I don't think it's quite as extreme the other direction, only because 
the big sources happen to be literally right on the edge. I mean, if you, if you make a wrong turn by 100 yards, you wind up in Arizona and if you're at Mule Creek. This stuff, I think, tends to make it into Arizona considerably more. But there is this, this border here. And so this is what, what I want to talk about eventually is this idea of this big data and how we start looking at these large-scale patterns. And one of the things that, that Jeff and I and, and Matt Peoples were talking about is that no one has ever really pulled all the obsidian data in the Southwest into a single database. Um, and, and Steve Shackley would have done the vast majority of this work, and so I just met with him a couple days ago of actually trying to get all of his data brought together into a sort of a publicly available, make the reports publicly available and get all this stuff together so we can start to see these big scale patterns with Obsidian data. Um, the other technique that we are increasing our use of, there was a small a peak when Hector Neff was at the reactor. He did a lot of uh, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. So has anybody ever here talked about that before? So I can't skip the, well, okay. Um, it's a really useful technique in that you can, I'll, there are different ways you can get the sample into the instrument, but basically you, you take a sample in the instrument, I'll tell you how you get it in a second, you heat it up to, I believe it's 10,000 degrees Celsius, and you actually strip, all, you ionize the sample, you're stripping off outer electrons, you bend it around an electromagnet one way or another, or you move the sample, but by controlling it, you basically separate the sample, the, tr the uh, charged atoms by charge and mass. Okay, and you can get really precise data. So the greater the charge, the tighter it bends, the higher the mass, the less it bends. Um, and you can do isotopic analysis this way. So, so Karen Schulmeyer and I just got a grant to look at strontium isotopes in the Southwest in bone. Um, and this would use you know, the same technique. We've got a particular instrument there that is really useful. It allows us to analyze multiple elements at a time or multiple isotopes at a time. So it has multiple collectors. Um, these instruments are, are not cheap. They're around a million dollars. Um, to get going in it, and, and it takes, we have a full-time ICP staff person who does nothing but fix and maintain these instruments because they're really precise, difficult things that I don't even pretend to know how to deal with. Um, on the simpler side, there are other, we have other ICP technology that allows us to, um, we can couple it with a laser, for example. So you could actually put a piece of pottery on there. Um, if you're looking at it in cross-section, you could specifically focus on grains of temper or the paste in between it. You can get down to about a 10 micron beam and hit really precise things. It's great if you want to look at the outside of pots, uh, if you want to look at paint. So that's something, um, who was it, Hannah and Hannah Will, that we had, we're working on some Salado paints where we're using a combination of XRF to get some idea of the composition of the paints and then using laser ablation to fine tune that data when we think we need to. Um, so. Those are some of the examples of, of the techniques. Um, one of the things that, so the problem is we, we're, we're making more and more data. And I was trying to hopefully come up with, let's see how I am on time. Oh, we're already halfway through, right? All right, that was the first quarter of my talk. So. Um, <laughs> and since I don't know what I'm saying in the second half, that, that works out well. Um, so what I would like to do really quickly is kind of contrast obsidian and ceramics. And I'm gonna talk about what the problems are as we increase these database sizes. Okay, so with obsidian, let's see if I can make a little better map here. If we make these sort of the Jemez Mountains up here at the top, um, you've got a complex of about five big sources up in the north. Uh, we'll put Mount Taylor somewhere over here. It's got two distinct chemistries, well, slightly distinct chemistries. Um, what do we got? We've got Red Hill over here. I'll talk about New Mexico just because it's a little easier for me. Mule Creek down here. We've got a couple minor sources out here that are actually really interesting and something I've been working on lately. And then there's a, there's a source down here and a couple sources. There's a, some stuff in Mexico that is really important that is not understood well enough. Um, and unfortunately, field work there is a little complicated. So um, it may be a while before that gets worked out. But obsidian is different than ceramics in terms of what you're looking at. So with obsidian, we, we get an artifact. We're just trying to get enough of the chemistry to match it to a known geologic source. And that's it. So in other words, we get very, if you looked at a plot of obsidian data, you know, if this is your source group, your artifacts tend to do this. You know, you get very discrete, there's another source. It's, it's never quite this easy, but that's the idea. Um, one of the problems with that then is, is what kind of questions you can ask. Because if you're an archeologist working out here, you don't, you can't necessarily understand interaction on the scale that you would like, right? Because if you've got folks, say, right here on the, on the Rio Grande, you don't, you're not able to necessarily track their interaction to the fine enough scale that we would like, right? I can't, I can't tell how they're interacting with folks 
to the east in particular, there aren't obsidian sources out there. So there are places in New Mexico where you can pick a site and you've got a source in any direction. So then you can make the argument, in, in some ways the sources differ, but you could argue that, well, when stuff's coming from the north, maybe they're interacting to the north, stuff's coming from the south. You can't always do that with obsidian because you don't always have sources where you would like there to be a source. Um, if it would be possible to engineer the sources, I would put ones out in just the right places so we could see where things are moving. Um, unfortunately, that's not always the case. Arizona, I think, is actually a little better. Your sources have a little better distribution. Um, it's not area. I'm, I'm not ultimately as, as familiar with it as I would like to be, but does that, is that a reasonable assessment, Jeff? But it's, you, can, you get a better feeling of large-scale interaction. Yes? Could you just that map a little bit? It won't make sense anyway, but I can try. <laughs> does that work? Okay. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, so just in case you missed it, this is New Mexico. That's Arizona. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so Obsidian has, allows us to answer all kinds of interesting questions, but it has some limitations. Now, one of its advantages is that there's a lot of it. We can analyze it quickly, cheaply, um, and non-destructively. So ceramics pose a very different problem in the sense that uh, Hector, I wish I, if I could have slides up here, I would have one, this one slide, which is one of my favorite things to show. Hector Neff created this, I don't know how you describe it, this sort of flow chart of of production and showing what it, its effects on chemistry. Right? So when you start with obsidian, you start with a nodule, you break it, you make flakes, you bury it in the ground, you get it. The chemistry is exactly the same. There's really nothing you can do to obsidian unless you really, really try, and I'm not even sure what you could do if you tried, to change the bulk chemistry. Right? So we've got, there's really nothing cultural you can do here. So we've got point sources, we've got discrete chemistries, and we've got people that can't do anything about it. Okay? Clay is exactly the opposite in every possible way. Um, clays occur almost anywhere. They are incredibly heterogeneous vertically, horizontally. There's all kinds of variability that gets into it naturally. And then people do everything you can possibly imagine to screw that up from there. So you take an impossible material and then you, you add temper, you take stuff out of it, you mix clays. Um, or my favorite is when they start, tempers are, are often very useful, they can give you something, but they start using grog tempers, which means they're taking old pots, crushing them up, and putting them into new pots. So doing bulk chemistry, you can see where that gives us a little bit of a problem when you're trying to understand where something's coming from, and they're mixing pottery even after it's produced. Um, so with ceramics, we get a, a completely different understanding of the world because we can have production at all kinds of places. So essentially, instead of geologic production, in very discrete localities, we get this stuff happening everywhere. And even at one place, you can get a significant amount of chemical variability. You could see, even within, you know, if you had a household production, you would see variability from pot to pot. And so when you look at a plot of ceramic data, instead of getting this usually nice discrete groups that you can eventually separate, you often get this big blob, and your job is to try to figure out when some of these dots seem to form more of a group than other types of dots. And this is something that it's, it's much more, it's almost more art than science, and it kind of depends on your approach, but it's, it's not a straightforward sort of match things up kind of thing. And, and one of, so one of the issues then is if we go out to a site, uh, you know, pick a random site X right here, and we sample 100 pots, and we get, you know, let's say we get kind of a, what looks like a group here, what looks like a group here, and what looks like a group here, and we decide that this is a group, this is a group, and this is a group. What happens is we change the scale of analysis. So what we don't know, and this is what makes it really difficult, um, no, let me back up a little bit. So if we try to treat ceramics like obsidian, so the obvious thing is, well, why don't you go out and sample the clays? Right? Go out, sample the clays. We get students that routinely submit projects to our lab. So like I said, our lab subsidizes outside researchers. We do our own research, but we subsidize a lot of projects. So we, we actually support about 30 projects a year. And most of them are probably graduate student projects. We get a lot of you know, uh, university professor projects. Um, they often think, well, I'm gonna go to the site, I'm gonna sample 100 pots, then I'm just going to walk the road cut and I'm gonna grab the five or six clays from the region, and then I want you to match the pottery to the clays. And that's a really common thing. And I, I often will tell students, it's not impossible to make a connection between a raw clay and, and the pottery, but it's, it's usually you'd be far better off submitting five more pots. And we can hopefully get better statistics in here than you would submitting the clays. So there are cases where the clays, the clays work, but it's, it's very different from obsidian, where you want the geologic samples, 
and, and, the, and the archaeological samples match. Pottery, it's a completely different world. So what we're actually trying to identify are production recipes, um, if you think about it. And the problem is what, what scale to work at. And this is kind of what I want to, I may come back, I think I'm skipping to the end of my talk here. Um, but it's something that, that we deal with all the time and it's becoming more and more of an issue. So if you go to a site and, and you sampled 100 pots, you get these three groups. And maybe we can find that certain types match certain groups and we can understand that you know, during this time period they were trading with what seems to match to the north or to the south. We get some interesting information about it. What happens is that the next grad student comes along and says, you know what, I'm gonna sample the site next door and I'm gonna sample another 300 pots. So now instead of having these groups, we have this unbelievably messy cloud and that's even on a small scale. So then you try to figure out, well, what's, how do we analyze these things? Because what may have been a production recipe here is now being hidden by another production recipe here and another one here, and you don't know if this is, is this one big recipe for the site or are these three separate groups? Okay, so this makes it really difficult, not impossible, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna downplay NAA and make it sound like we don't get great results out of it, because it really does provide some very interesting information. But I'm getting to uh, what happens when we scale it up to the next level. So this is where people have been working up until now. What, we're going to, what we get now, and I'll talk about an example from um, where I've been doing a lot of work in Cañada Alamosa, which is this drainage roughly about here in New Mexico. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and give a little background on this. So it's, it sits in an area, it probably should be a little bit farther north, um, kind of in between the sort of classic southern Mugion type ceramics and the northern ceramics. So it's always in this, throughout time, it's in this frontier zone. Later on, you get groups up here of pottery production. And we see all of these types at different sites and different times within the canyon. What they're not doing is making painted pottery there, which is really interesting, with one exception. Um, but for the most part, from what we can tell from the neutron activation is all the pot painted pottery is coming in from other areas. So what this means is that we're not just comparing 100 samples from that local site. We're now comparing the 100 samples that are submitted from that site to huge databases from here, from here, from up here, from over here, from down here. And some of these, for example, the Mimbris database um, is, was the dissertation work of Jeff Speakman, um, who used to work at, at the research reactor. And I believe it's upwards of 4,000 samples of painted Mimbris ceramics. And I think he has somewhere on the order of 40 or 50 compositional groups worked out to the point where he, think, he, he, he argues he can detect even site level production in some cases, or even finer scale. Problem is this, this all starts to get muddy and really fuzzy when you start looking at bigger and bigger and bigger data. Um, so what, what I want to contrast here is a little bit is that the reactor is doing some really interesting things and getting bigger and bigger data, but it creates more and more problems in terms of our scale of analysis. And what we don't quite understand yet is how to deal with areas where data are a little fuzzier. Um, and there are, there are some places where uh, a good contrast would be um, Donna Galacki's work on the Northern San Juan. I don't know if I got that. Maybe here, I don't know. I can't <laughs> I've thought too much on my own map. Um, so kind of south and, what would that be? South and east of Mesa Verde. Uh, there, it's, there really is no way to carve up her data set in really obvious chunks. It's not like the members data. Yes? Um, okay. Ah, okay. Well, you think I maybe should start over here? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. He's asking what the various plots are. This is just an example of an XY elemental plot. So it could be element X and element Y, kind of picking arbitrary elements, whatever that may be. And that's what this is to indicate too. So when we're looking at this, we're actually looking at it in 30 dimensional multivariate space. But I think of things in terms of bivariate plots because that's what I, I look at those. I think about them in multivariate terms and we run statistics on multivariate statistics. But I, I think of, it's easiest to explain it in, in simple bivariate plots. So these actually have nothing to do with the map if that, if that was creating any confusion. Um, where was it? Oh, so as a, a contrast, I kind of like to think about this. Donna Glackey's data set was really difficult um, for a number of reasons. I think it has to do with the nature of the clays, the nature of production. Um, but in her case, it was really a matter of taking this broad scatter of data and, and kind of just creating boundaries within it. And I don't want to make it sound as though they're arbitrary. There's reasons behind what she did, what she did and how she did it. Um, but it's, it's a very difficult split. It's, it's, 
it's more complicated than some other regions. Uh, I've done a recent project with Scott Van Kieran looking at a number of Pueblos, Sholo and Four Mile and some of these data where we get the absolute cleanest data I have ever seen. And we've got very few unassigned samples and it is just, there's that production and that is that site. There's that production and it's that site. And it's probably a function of specialization. So you've got fewer and fewer potters uh, making more and more of the painted pottery. Um, so there are cultural reasons for it, geologic reasons for it, analytical reasons for it. Um, and so data usually fall in between these extremes of a big fuzzy mess versus really tight, discrete groups. Um, and, and that's where most of this fits. But the problem is the scale of analysis. And so what happens when you look at 100 samples from a site or 1,000 samples from a region? Can you identify the same scale of production? Can we see individual potters doing this? And so as an example of this, um, and it's one that I worked on for many years and never really worked out to my satisfaction at all, uh, is the Caddo region. So working with uh, Tim Pertola and has, has submitted most of these samples. So this is, will this be kind of Texas, Arkansas region? Um, the data there, you get, well, I don't know if I can draw another map here. Um, what happened there, this is kind of a good example, is you, I'll draw a plot here first. So I think you can imagine where Texas, Arkansas, that area is. There are three, three or four major kind of east to west river systems. And so that's kind of critical to our second, and along with a big vertical river. Um, you get, when, when this data first was submitted to us, it was submitting you know, the first 100 samples. And they found sort of, kind of some groups. I mean, there's, there's fuzz in between, but there were five or six groups that seemed to be identified. They seemed to have some logic on the ground. As that database grew, not to be four or 500 samples, these groups started to kind of blend together. So then it became, in order to make this group statistically valid, you had to start throwing out more and more of the samples as unassigned. And that's something that is not that uncommon. We do that all the time in neutron activation data, um, is throw out unassigned samples. So they're either intermediates or they're just weird outliers, potentially analytical errors. There are any number of things. But these groups held together. By the time I got to the reactor, I think his database was up in the seven, 800 samples from this, from this region. And everything was one big blob. It was really essentially a big scatter plot that you could just as easily make your groups here and here as you could here and here. And it got to the point where it was 1,000 samples and 60% of them were unassigned. And that just seemed unacceptable to me. And it wasn't providing the information we wanted. It wasn't giving us any information about production, with the exception of the Red River. The Red River seemed to be distinct and have a couple different groups depending on how high up the river you were. Um, so what we tried to do is to, what made sense. We tried to divide the data set. So what if we take this river system, make three separate regions, look at each region individually, see if my hope was we would identify a core production group and an outlier group, and then we'd do that down here at another river system, we'd identify a different core, and then ideally this core would match with this outlier and this core with this outlier, and we could see exchange up and down the river system. I thought this would be great. So I spent weeks and weeks looking at each, basically at this as 11 separate projects, created all these core groups and little tiny peripheral groups. And it turns out the core groups look like this. <laughs> and then we still have a couple little outlier groups and that's it. And it, I, I think there are, for someone who's maybe more creative and talented than I am, there may be ways of parsing this up, um, but it's, it's not real straightforward. And this kind of, and we're starting to see this in some places in the Southwest. Um, we've got, for example, I think we now have about three or 4,000 samples. Um, maybe I'll draw a new map of, or of New Mexico here. Let's see. I always forget which side the notch is on. Um, from this whole sort of southern New Mexico, kind of white sands, Fort Hood, all those big military projects that, that produce a lot of samples, we've got a lot of data on Hornado, El, Hornado, El Paso, and other brown wares. Um, and the more we work with it, the, in some ways, the more difficult it is getting to be. We've started, we've tried to start over, and this is something, I, I would hope to spend weeks thinking about this and come to this talk with this grand, you know, this is how we need to do it. And unfortunately, the more I thought about it, the more I realized it, it's just really complicated. And I'm not sure there is a one size solution to figuring out these large databases, because at some point it gets so big, I don't know whether we could tell production here from production here, or whether we're looking at large scale valleys or, or how that's worked out. And so we've, we've, we've made progress on this. We have groups that we think are limited to certain drainages or certain river systems. Um, 
but they're really, they're very difficult to distinguish on certain scales and it's, it's getting more complicated. So the question then is what happens as we start looking at on this, this much bigger scale. So the Kenyatta Alamosa is such an interesting example because, have I got time to, oh, I can talk about this one. This one's my favorite. Because we get this painted pottery from everywhere. We get stuff, we've got over 35 different painted types at the site. Um, that's a really diverse sample, and it's probably, I would, yeah, it's probably one of the most diverse ceramic assemblages of anywhere in the Southwest. Because everybody's bringing stuff in, for, or they're getting stuff, or however it's getting there, um, from all over the Southwest. And it, it makes it really difficult to then start comparing your data to, it, it's, it's essentially doing like 20 different dissertations every time you try to plug samples into something, and it becomes really complicated. Where it's exceptionally interesting, this will, I'll get, so I'll at least present you some archaeological data. You came here to hear, to hear a talk, so I'll talk just a very briefly about why I think it's important to not get too hung up on creating these grand ideas of social interaction and movement of people by only looking at one type of material culture. So this is a really good example of this because the, the typical approach that, that they had taken um, to some extent until I got involved in the project um, I think it, it would be reasonable to say they, were, they had planned to do a lot of work. So it's Carl Lumbaugh, Tony Lumbaugh, Steve Lexon, a number of folks who worked in this area. Um, they were planning to do the nutrient activation analysis, and that's what got me involved in the project. Um, their assumption was that all the obsidian was coming out of secondary deposits on the Rio Grande, that they're close enough that they would just be going there for obsidian. And I argue, you know, let's just, I kind of convinced them we should run all the samples anyway. Let's just see what it is. And since that time, I'm, I'm more and more convinced that secondary deposits on the Rio Grande are not a significant source of material. Um, I'd be happy to talk about that later, why I think that's the case. But the question is then, where are they getting their obsidian? And does it match with the ceramic data? So what's interesting about this site is that there are very clear, there, for example, the pit house period occupation in Cañada Alamosa looks very southern. These look like southern pit, house architecture, pit houses architecturally, and the ceramics actually match production from the south. Seems great. These are southern guys. Let's just stop there. When you look at the obsidian, if I, I'm going to look at my notes here so I get it at least close to right. Okay, you look at the obsidian, 80% of the obsidian in the pit house period context is coming from the north. Now, there's a chance that the northern sources are what's going to appear in the river system, there's a chance that that could be the case. I, I would argue that that's not. I think they are actually getting material directly or indirectly from the northern sources. So here we have a case where we have pottery and architecture and every other way these people are looking southern and yet somehow the obsidian is coming from the north. So I won't try to, to explain all my reasons for why I think that might be the case, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting scenario. There's another occupation in the valley, and these are, there are four sites, so the, I, I talk about it as kind of being one. There are four sites, but in reality, you could almost throw a rock from one to the next. It's, they're, not, they're not far away. Um, there's a clear membrous occupation. So architecturally, it looks like a membrous site. Painted pottery, it's membrous black on white pottery. There's not a real doubt there. When we look at it by nutrient activation, we can actually fit it into very specific production. In fact, we can distinguish between stuff that's being produced in the Eastern Membris versus the Central Membris Valley. It's really, it's an interesting scenario. When we look at the obsidian, it's an even mix of Northern and sort of Western and Southwestern sources. So now we've got still Southern people, but now they're getting their obsidian from all over the place. There's a Socorro occupation, which is folks that look like people just right to the North. The pottery matches the Socorro production. We've matched it to production locations to the north. They're bringing in Socorro pottery. Well, they're getting it one way or another, except all the obsidian is coming from the west now and to the south. Now, when I say all in the Socorro occupation, it consists of a total of four flakes. So most of these assemblages are much bigger. So I don't want to make statistical assessments about this, but it, the fact that there are only four flakes actually tells us something really interesting and that maybe from an obsidian world, these folks are oriented in a way that they're just not getting obsidian. And that's one of, one of the more interesting questions. But again, there's a disconnect between the architecture and the ceramics and the obsidian. There's a Magdalena occupation here, or migration, or however, <laughs> we're dealing with this in a paper right now of how to classify this in terms of what it is. But the argument in general is that it's carbon painted pottery, folks that are up in the Mesa Verde region, when this area collapses, we know they go a whole bunch of different ways, and one of them seems to actually be down to Gaina Springs, which is a little north, 
as well as to Kenyatta Alamosa. And then there is some level of interaction, whether it's people moving or pots moving or whatever it is, to other sites to the south and actually even out this direction. But this carbon painted pottery sticks out in this part of the world. There is really isn't much other carbon painted pottery here. But this looks, if you didn't know better and you were standing in the middle of the site, you would swear you're sitting in Mesa Verde. It, the, the masonry looks right. It's, it's kind of in a defensive location. Um, and the, the pottery is not necessarily linked to Mesa Verde pottery. I think this distance is too great. Now, whether we find that one pot that someone carried would be really cool, but I think that'd be a difficult case to make. But there's a clear connection here between these other Magdalena sites, one way or another. Um, but this pottery right here, which should, if anything, these people are coming from the north. The folks at Gaina Springs, they are, we know pottery is moving this direction. We can't document it the other way, but we know it's moving at least this way. They're right next to Mount Taylor, or very close to it. If you go to the obsidian assemblage here, it's almost entirely Mount Taylor. There's not a single Mount Taylor flake in the Magdalena assemblage at Kenyatta Alamosa. So somehow the pottery is moving across this boundary, but the obsidian is not. And it's this really interesting dichotomy. So if you're there, you'd swear it's the site, it's where it's people from Mesa Verde, and yet somehow the lithics are creating a very different picture. And again, reasons to look at more than one material culture type. Um, to give you one last example, we do have a Tularosa occupation, which is, I may not be drawing this quite right, but it's kind of Zuni, Cibola area. Um, we get a lot of White Mountain red wares and things at the site. And in those occupations, which may or may not actually overlap in time with the Magdalena occupation, um, the obsidian is primarily from the south and west again. So there's this, the pottery and the people swing one way, whether it's the people moving or the pottery or their connections, it's hard to say. But when, when ceramic and architectural affiliations swing one way, we often see obsidian swing the other. And you could make a number of cases and, and scenarios for why that may be the case. Maybe it's differences between men and women accessing different interaction scales or different groups, or whether it's people purposely trying to maintain social ties in different directions. You know, this is, the Southwest is always kind of an edgy marginal environment throughout his prehistory. And maybe there's reasons to all of a sudden when you know these folks up here and you're, you're affiliated with them one way or another, or you came from here, there's a good reason to have some economic interaction in different directions. So, uh, so I'll, I'll I'm not sure if there's anything else. We want to open it up to, que to, pick to questions, or I'm not sure if I leave you with a, a really good final point, but yes. Oh. OK, one sec. I'm curious. Did, have you revisited older data, data sets that were maybe based upon morphology of the artifacts or stylistic and conclusions that were based on that and, and revisited it with NAA and come up with conclusions that either confirmed or clearly conflicted with conclusions that were made based upon that earlier? I mean, I yes, don't know if I'm being I think clear. That's, a, that's a really good question is that, well, I guess what you're saying is testing our assumptions of maybe production locations and things like that. Yes. So a good example might be the idea, the, the standard method, and I, I think it's still useful, is that if you want to understand, um, in fact, we use this with uh, Jeff Clark and, and Deb Huntley's with their Salado work, is if you want to try to understand local production, you look at the brown wares, right? The brown wares are going to be local. The painted ceramics are going to be imported. And I think that's a, it's a valid argument to at least test in many cases. Um, there's a good counter of that if it, uh, with Karen Hari and um, her graduate student, Tim Ferguson, who actually used to work at our lab. No relation to me, but used to work at our lab. He just looked the same height and, and everything. Um, they were looking at Shivwitz pottery, so southern Nevada, and found that they're actually moving brown wares uh, what is it, over 75 or 80 kilometers across the Grand Canyon um, that we would not have anticipated without seeing the neutron activation analysis. Um, there are, in some ways, I think your question is, that is, is the crux of every NAA project when you're doing ceramics is if we, everybody has ideas of where things are made and produced and, and move, and, and that's what the NAA is doing, is really testing to see if that's the case. Um, I can't come up with one right off the bat where I'm thinking of, uh, well, clearly now we know um, this or that. I mean, the Magdalena would be a good example of this site might be a good case where we weren't sure if all of these other painted types are being imported. I mean, there's no reason these people couldn't have necessarily made White Mountain Redware, um, but they didn't. They imported it all, but they made Magdalena ceramics there. That's the only painted pottery type that they actually produced there. Um, and without the neutron activation data, we wouldn't have been able to do that. And this is one of the few cases where we actually can match pottery to clay. It's a rare case where we actually have local clays that really seem to match the pottery. And exactly why that's the case, I couldn't tell you, but it seems to. Um, 
we have ways where we can kind of cheat the system a little bit, and we can mathematically mix clays and tempers and try to make things match a little bit, and sometimes that works. Usually it, it doesn't. But, all right. Does that sufficiently answer your question? I just wondered if any <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. I should probably come up with a good example of that. I'm sure it's been done. Um, that's a good question, but I don't, I don't have a good answer for it. So. Okay, next question is here. I'd like some more detail on your neutron activation analysis. What's the radiation from your reactor? Is it neutrons bombarding the sample? What's it do to the nuclei in those samples? And why does it give off characteristic gamma rays? Okay. And See, this is why I'm the archaeologist in the group and not the physicist. But I'll do my best to kind of explain. Unfortunately, the physicists can probably see this now online and I'll get in trouble. But um, essentially, you're, bomb you're hitting the sample with neutrons. You're essentially adding neutrons in there. And then based, you're just getting a traditional, typical half-life decay of that element. And when it decays, it's giving off gamma rays that we detect. And, and particular, and the gamma ray is the energy of that gamma ray is characteristic of the element. I don't know if that's detailed enough for you. So we actually run um, two, just to give you a little background, we run, so every sample has two different irradiations and then three different counts. Um, there are a number of other laboratories that in, now and in the past that do neutron activation. Most of them tend to do either one irradiation and two counts or maybe two irradiations and one count. And we get, the, the idea of different irradiations and counts is that Different elements have different half-lives. So if you were to look at certain elements have a very, get highly radioactive really fast, but they have a very short half-life. So their decay on a same scale would look like this. Aluminum would be a good example of that. It has a two minute half-life. Um, so we can't put a, a sample in the reactor and measure it a week later and get any aluminum data. It's gone. But at the same time, if we tried to analyze that sample 20 minutes out of the reactor for something like chromium, that decay curve by comparison is, is this. We could never see it here because there's so much aluminum it's swamped out. So what we do is we run three, two separate irradiations. One of them is run like a pneumatic tube at the bank. You actually put it in a little plastic canister that shoots into the reactor at about 40 miles an hour, shoots back out five seconds later. We wait 20 minutes for enough of the aluminum to decay away that it's safer to handle. And then we measure it for about seven or eight elements that are real short half-life elements. We take another sample, put that in a quartz vial, ultra high purity quartz vial, that goes into the reactor for 24 hours. We don't get it back until a week later. So then we're measuring elements that are, you kind of think about it like this. So we're measuring elements out here that have half-life that decays of days or, you know, on the day, order of days or maybe weeks. We take that same sample, measure it a week later, we put it back in a lead cave, measure it again two weeks later, after that or three weeks later for a second measurement and get another suite of elements that have much longer half-lives. What's, what's the source in the reactor? Is it enriched uranium? Yes. So we are one of the very few highly enriched uranium reactors that are left. Um, they're making a conversion to low enriched uranium. 20%? Enriched what? to 20% U-235? That's way beyond what I would be able to tell you. <laughs> Even if I know, I'm not sure I'd be allowed to tell you. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what. I, I try to avoid learning anything that I can't say so that I don't get myself in trouble. But they're, it's, it's actually kind of fascinating. They are planning to switch to a low enriched uranium, and that should happen soon. Um, but what's particularly interesting is we fall right at the maximum of what a research reactor can be. And to switch to low enriched uranium and have the same flux, we actually would bump up to being a power reactor. Even though it would have the same effective flux, we actually would have to be completely reclassified in a way that we could never function. So the process is slowed down by trying to figure out through the Nuclear Regulatory Commission how to still maintain a research reactor status while theoretically increasing power, but effectively maintaining the same power. And I'm not sure if I'm explaining that exactly right, but there, is, there are plans to switch over to low enriched uranium. You mentioned that you're working in a 30-dimensional space in terms of number of variables. Mm -hmm. What are examples of some of the multivariate techniques you use, and how successful are they in reducing the dimensionality of the problem? Oh, that's, a, that's a very good question. I think you get a very different answer depending on who you talk to. Um, I, I really like existing in bivariate plots. I think that once you jump to a lot of statistics such as principal components or canonical discriminant or some of these ways that, some of these methods that try to, how should I put it, stack the variability um, into fewer elements effectively, 
I think you, you can create false patterns that may not really be there. Um, so I think using a, a number of different techniques. The classic way that I approach it is I, our software allows us to do, you know, I'll get one computer screen and I plot one element at a time and I'll get 30 plots in a little grid like this where I can see they'll have element X on the, on the X axis and I'll have 30 different elements on the Y. And I can sort of get a view, if you think in multidimensional space, what of those Y elements are creating any kind of pattern separation, then I replot that on the X axis and look for other separations. Sometimes a group will pull out because it just happens to be really high in manganese or, or iron or whatever it is. You, you separate that data out, you see if it really does stay as a group and you work through it that way. I often then test those groups using multivariate statistics. So our, the classic one we use is called Mahalanobis distance. And what all it really does is if you say, I've got these groups, it looks at every member of this group and asks, what is the probability of its belonging to that group and what's the probability it belongs to any other group? And you can sometimes tweak your groups that way. If you get samples that maybe in the bivariate plots look like they belong here, but in this multivariate space that I can't comprehend, it, it's too intermediate between groups. You throw it out and these groups get cleaner. Sometimes you bring samples back in that wouldn't have done it visually. Um, it's, a, it's a surprisingly complicated process that really, and, and a lot of it is experience and feel. Um, what can happen when you do this Mahalanobis thing, and I, I'll get students that come and train with me and I really have to demonstrate how this happens, is all of a sudden you start, you start adding samples over here, and again, I'm showing it in bivariate plots, understand this is happening in much more complex space. What ends up happening is you, your groups kind of shift and you constantly you keep doing this again and again and you get these dancing groups that just start rotating around each other and you, you, know, you, you need to get a feel for when you hit that point where this is not gonna get me anywhere and I need to start over or stop here or redefine it. Um, and how well these techniques work depends on the region as well. As an example, um, with Donna Glowacki's material in the San Juan Basin, most of her group memberships, let's just make a real simple thing, let's say it's groups one, two, and three, for sample X, you might have 70% probability in group one, 40% in two, and 30% in three. And in this data set, that's as clean as you're gonna get. That makes a decent group member here. In that data set from Scott Van Curen, I've got you know, high percentage here and absolutely zeros across the board for all 12 other groups. It's incredibly clean. There's, I don't think there's a single sample that even has to the third decimal place any probability in any other group. Um, and again, that's, that's the geology, but I think there's a lot of social things going on in there too, and that you start reducing the scale of production or focusing the scale of production. And you, know, you see this in historic data too. You start looking at historic pottery and things really shrink up. My, I'll, I'll give a quick aside. My favorite example is actually from Egypt. Um, and I may have talked to you about this one, Mary, but I've worked with folks in, in upper Egypt, which is at, at a time period where the Egyptian and Nubian boundary is shifting. And, and the gist of production, as they've explained it to me, is the Egyptians are large-scale production, the Nubians are more small-scale, household, community-level production. They're all using the Nile clays. There's no other, there's, there's one big clay. It's one river system. There's not big tributaries coming in to change the, the chemistry. So they're using the same clays, same raw materials. What you see is a plot that looks like this. It's basically one group. So it's group one and group 1A. 1A is Egyptian. One is Nubian. And it has to do with that scale of production. I right? mean, the Egyptians do it, they're using exactly the same clays on a factory scale. They're mixing it exactly right. They're doing everything exactly the same way, even though it's all the same materials. I can't separate this group out at all. Okay, every one of the Egyptian pots belongs in the Nubian group, but not the other way around. Um, and you can see that in, in, in some examples in the Southwest too. So scale of production is a really cool thing to look at. I think that answered about eight questions you didn't ask. But, well. Next question. Uh, I have another question about the reactor. Yes. Um, I know you, you do have a, a neutron source because you're doing NAA. I was wondering if you do any other sorts of analyses uh, using neutrons, such as maybe neutron diffraction or something like that. There, or if it would be possible to set those up in the future. Uh, there definitely, there is. There is actually a whole neutron scattering group um, that does it. They tend to focus more on questions of physics. Um, I couldn't tell you, I haven't been involved in any particular, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I think Mike Glasscock has done some prompt gamma analysis, but that's very similar to neutron activation analysis, not something fundamentally different. There are folks that do it, but not from an archeological, not within the archeological group. But if it's something you're interested in, um, we could probably figure out a way to do it, because there aren't a whole lot of places you can go to do it. So 
Yeah, thank you. Another question. I have one quick question. How much variability do you see within it, like a single pot or a single shirt? It's a good question. We try to tell people not to do that. Um, <laughs> on a, so, so that's a that's a that's a potential problem, right? And that we've I I'm going to go around this answer and not answer it really well. <laughs> um, one of the things we try to do in our analysis is use a, we don't want to cause any more destruction than we have to. So we still minimize our sample, but we actually use about a thumbnail size piece. Um, and we don't need anywhere near that much for the actual, you know, what goes in the reactor. But what it allows us to do is homogenize as big a chunk as we think we can reasonably do. And then we, we, we grind that to a fine powder and sample out of that. So that in some ways helps to, to, to homogenize a sample and reduce that, that variability. Um, we have had a couple cases where, you know, we'll get somebody from the Great Basin who's doing Fremont stuff, and you know, they, they had six shirts from the site, and they need to spend money on analysis, so we're willing to do it, but they think that five of them are from the same pot. And we can sort of make that assessment. There are times where I'll say, I think these are very, very similar. Um, a lot of times what we get is we'll get, um, I can see it in sometimes we'll get, you know, this group of pottery here, and then we'll get just this odd outlier, and there'll be a, a pair to it. And I kind of have to wonder, and they stick together really well. I have to kind of wonder if this is just one weird pot that they thought was so interesting, they sampled it twice in different shirts, things like that. Um, so I'm sure it happens. It's a good question. I'm sure, I have no doubt that people have analyzed the same pot 20 times to look at this, but yeah, so. I used IC, sorry. <laughs> I used ICP uh, for some research that I did, and I analyzed four shards from the same vessel, and they all grouped together very closely and away from all the other vessels for the same thing, because I was trying to combine some ICP data and some NAA data, and so it helped to just double check how the ICP data was doing in terms of its quality. So, so they stayed together in that instance. I would be surprised if you if you would ever get it to fall into a different group. But again, the scale of groups is so variable. Depending on where you're working, one scale. A good example of this, we had a guy uh, bring in 100 samples from New Caledonia, first pottery that had ever been analyzed from New Caledonia. And he came to visit, and we, we sat down and we worked on it. And this is where I really learned my lesson, is that we spent oh, three or four days trying to find variability in this group. And we just could There was one sample that plotted way outside, but 99 we just couldn't find any pattern to. We'd, we'd divide it up this way, we'd divide it up that way. Finally, I said, this is something I do every time now, right from the beginning. I said, let's just plot it against a data set from Hungary or anything, just so we understand the scale of variability we were looking at. And if you look at your average project, you get a group and a group and a group. This New Caledonia, all 99 samples look like this. It was the most uniform, consistent internal group you've ever seen. But until you understand the relative scale, we spent all this time trying to divide this thing any which way, and we never could. And we were just thinking about it at the wrong scale. And that kind of comes back to this sort of scale of analysis and how you have to look at things. It's, it's very subjective and, and can become very difficult when you start getting lots of data involved. Any other questions? David. Speaking as a geologist, where does geology play into this? I mean. There is some, looking at it as a geologist, there were some, some regions, like for example, northern um, Sonora, uh, sorry, northern Chihuahua, where I would say don't even try and do yes. neutron activation on uh, ceramics. That doesn't stop people from because, trying. Because, but, yeah, yeah, I know. It, because it's all, the geology is absolutely uniform across um, the northern part of, uh, of, of northern Chihuahua. I, that is a big issue, and that's, for example, Egypt would be a good example of that, where even though the geology is variable, where they're getting the clays is not. Yeah. And so that's, I, I think that is a big part, and you have to know that geology. And the geology plays a part. For example, the Membrus, a lot of the southwest is actually really, a, generally a good place to do neutron activation on a, on a big scale. You get down to the southern part, it's more complicated. Um, but geology certainly plays a part, and your hope might be that even if the geology in a region is different, is, is highly uniform, that their use of specific tempers and things might create the variability that would allow you to see behavioral differences, even mm -hmm. if it's not geologically based. Um, but that's where, to some extent, the, the, the interplay between NAA and petrography can come in, 
and, and tell you, kind of give you an idea of what's driving this chemical variability. Because that's one of the things neutron activation doesn't necessarily tell you. We're looking at bulk composition. Um, and, and so, and I, I'm not an expert with the mineralogy to be able to say, oh, okay, yeah, it's, you know, it's this element that's driving it. It's clearly this mineral that's coming in. There are people who could do that, and I, it's something I'm, I'm working on. Um, but by one strategy that works really well is to do the neutron activation, define your groups in some way, and then sample those for petrography, try to understand what the geology is behind and what's driving those groups. Um, but there definitely are places where it doesn't work, and northern Mexico would be a good example. And despite my best efforts to tell people that it's probably not going to work, we still get people that think they have a way to make it work and submit samples, and we try. But I had someone who's a well-known, I, I won't say his name because I don't want to misquote him, but I was riding in a taxi with him and I was discussing, I said, I have this project from, this was Chihuahua that we were talking about, and, and really, you know, just south of, of most of New Mexico. And so I got this new project coming in, I'm trying to get this data to work, and he said, run. He said, don't, don't even look at the data, run as fast as you can away from it. Um, and again, I'm not smart enough to listen to it, so I've been trying to deal with it for years, and yeah, it hasn't worked. So. Hey, well, thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, Jeffrey, thank you so much. Yeah, it was a fascinating you. talk. All right, thanks.